Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. So just as a quick note, we did send out these slides to everyone in advance. It was a great idea from one of our PO one-on-one -on -one calls. Someone suggested and requested that we send these before the meeting so that you can more easily take notes during them. If you did not receive the slides prior to this meeting, that means that you are not officially on our invite for the meeting series. The meeting series was just forwarded to you. So we would love to have you on the actual meeting series because the problem is when meetings are forwarded, if we cancel it or something else along those lines, you don't get the cancellation if the meeting is forwarded to you, nor will you necessarily get these communications in advance, like with the slides. So if you didn't, if you could email Lifa and I will put her email in the chat for you, uh, we will make sure that you get added to the actual invite in the future. So. Like I said, if you did get the slides, you're on the invite, you're all set. If you didn't, you aren't, and we would like you to be. So uh, I will add that later on in the meeting so that you can reach out to her and let her know. As far as today, here's the topics we're going to be covering. We have exciting news for you all about virtual fall regional meetings that we'll go into. I want to speak with you briefly about the Patient Empowerment Toolkit. We have... Dashboard 2.0 updates that Laria on our team is going to go over with you. I want to talk a bit about primary care practice recruitment, your three specialist VBR, and then just a few really quick reminders at the end. So first, fall virtual regional meetings. So the main request that we get for what we could do differently about our regional meetings in the future is to have them virtually so that it's more easy for uh, your practices to attend and for maybe others than just the clinical champion to be able to attend since we've had to limit capacity at these meetings and just the challenge of having them in person. So us in partnership with Inhale proposed to Blue Cross Blue Shield that we host one set of these meetings virtually in order to just accommodate the practices to take your feedback into account um, and to make these a little bit easier. So this request was approved. And as you can see in this slide, it was approved for 2024 only for now. So what that means is if we want these to continue, both you and your participating practices, we really need to demonstrate that engagement on these virtual meetings is high enough to warrant having them that way in the future as well. Um, understandably, Blue Cross and us at the Coordinating Center do have concerns about hosting these virtually just because, as I'm sure you've all seen in virtual meetings, it can be challenging to really have that engagement and discussion that you can have in an in-person meeting. So we're going to take a lot of steps as the coordinating center to help ensure engagement. But of course, we need the partnership of you and the clinical champions at the sites in order for this to be successful. So we'll talk a little bit about what that will look like. The rationale for doing this it's multiple, and this is very similar to the rationale that we provided to Blue Cross on why we wanted to do these. So first, we're recruiting additional practices in 2024, as you all know, and as we'll discuss later on this meeting. And so that may result in adding a ninth region or even more so, and that just a on our team is a lot too, to have these multiple meetings. And so to do that twice in a year is uh, a lot of additional undertaking. So in order to expand regions and potentially have another one in the future based on recruitment, it makes sense to have some of these virtual. As we've already mentioned, the practice requests for these meetings, so the burden of additional travel, depending on the location of the practice site and the location of the regional meeting, plus attending these meetings following a full day of clinic most of the time, uh, we do want to accommodate that and reduce the burden on your sites as much as possible. Uh, growing participation in the population health CQIs, so I know we're having virtual meetings as a inhale, I believe, or having regional meetings as an inhale, I believe my mind is as well. So as there's multiple requirements across different programs and participations in these programs increase, we just want to be mindful of that as well, of the different asks across the CQIs. Having these meetings virtual will also be able to have us offer a larger range of keynote speakers. So we'll be able to bring in national speakers to be able to attend these versus the challenge of having someone have to travel to seven in-person meetings. Uh, it'll be nice to be able to do this on a smaller scale and be able to expand who can present at them. 
And then also allowing additional attendees from the practices. So I know in the past, PILs have asked, hey, like other attendees from the practice want to come other than the clinical champion, but because our meeting spaces are just limited in capacity, we haven't been able to always accommodate that. And with virtual, of course, there's going to be no limit on that, which will be nice. So it'll be able to have larger numbers of attendees from the practices join if they're interested in doing so. The way we will likely do this is instead of just hosting one virtual regional meeting, we're going to still keep them in that regional format. So we're going to collapse it a little bit. So instead of doing seven, we'll probably do four. We'll keep the regions together, but we'll likely combine some of the smaller regions. So like the Sleeping Bear region in Traverse City is one of our smaller ones, as are some of the west side of the state. We might make those one. We want to keep the regions together because we do want to continue to build relationships amongst the uh, practices and clinical champions in each region. And so having those clinical champions still together, even in this virtual format, we felt was beneficial. We'll also pull the practice clinical champions on a convenient time. We've been doing for our in-person ones, 6 to 8 p.m., as you know. But without that travel and maybe with clinic hours ends, it's a little bit easier to do it earlier, maybe later. So we'll just send out a poll and try to find a time that works best, understanding that everyone's going to have different preferences and we won't be able to meet all needs there. But we'll at least assess it since we have that opportunity to do so. We would continue to have the fall regional meetings be PCPs attending these only. So as we did in 2023 and plan to do moving forward in 2024, we're going to have the spring regional meetings with PCPs, endocrinologists, and nephrologists, and the fall meetings with the PCPs only and separate nephrology and endocrinology clinical champion meetings in the fall. And like I've already touched on, full engagement in these meetings is going to be both expected and required in order to earn VBR for attendance and to continue the possibility of these meetings being virtual in the future. So what that means is we'll likely have requirements around completing a survey at the end. Let me actually get into that on this next slide. So what engagement is going to look like? We'll want cameras on for the duration of these meetings. There will be expected interaction during these meetings. So whether that's via Zoom polls, breakout rooms, questions and comments, and things shared via the chat, a post-meeting survey that all clinical champions are going to be required to submit in order to receive credit for attendance at the meeting. So, and as I'm saying, this is what we want to do to establish the engagement and participation at these if these standards aren't met and the attendees don't demonstrate a high level engagement. I don't anticipate that Blue Cross Blue Shield will approve these meetings being virtual in the future. Like there's some hesitancy and concern as there is. So we really want to demonstrate that we are able to do this in a way that still creates meaningful connection and participation from the sites. We'll include these engagement requirements at the registration and at the start of the virtual meetings so that it's incredibly clear to the attendees like what that looks like. And then as far as next steps, first, we're going to be determining the dates and times for these regional meetings via polls, like I said, for the times. We're looking at dates right now. We'll send out an email to the clinical champions announcing the virtual meetings, the requirements for attendance, the dates, and calendar holds. We'll reiterate the requirements for engagement at the registration process. And then moving forward, based on the success of the fall virtual meetings, we'll get a decision on if we're able to hold future meetings virtually as well. So like I said, it's gonna be really critical that we demonstrate that we can do these in a way that is meaningful. We will always be holding the spring meetings in person because we do think these in-person meetings have a lot of value. I can see it myself with the relationships that have been built amongst the practices and the conversations that happen there. Uh, so we do want to have that balance of both being accommodating and uh, fair to the time of the clinical champions and also to the work of the collaborative and the sharing and the things that do happen in person. Any questions about virtual meetings? Okay, well, more to come on that in the future. Oh, 
And as a quick aside, the spring regional meeting registration will be opening up this week. So you and your practice clinical champions will receive an email to register shortly. Like I said, it's going to be PVCPs, endocrinologists, and nephrologists for this spring, including newly joined endocrinology and nephrology practices as well. And then just as a reminder, as part of the PO scorecard, we're asking you to ensure that practice registration three weeks prior to the meeting date. So uh, you'll be able to view their registration on the administrative portal and follow up with clinical champions who have not registered yet. Switching gears, I wanted to talk with you all a bit about the patient empowerment toolkit. So this would be a really fantastic time for you to demonstrate your engagement on virtual meetings and feel free to speak up or put things in the chat regarding this. So we announced the patient empowerment toolkit at the fall 2023 regional meetings. It began being available to be prescribed on November 17th. We included a reminder about it in the January newsletter. And Blue Cross Blue Shield reached out to us and said, hey, prescription of this toolkit have been lower than we've anticipated. And we have actually just in the past couple of days received communications from a couple of you about like different challenges that your practices have had around this. But wanted to take some time at this meeting to just check in with you and would love for you to either unmute or put things in the chat about challenges that you've been having around the patient empowerment toolkit. So have you heard things from your practices? If you have, what have you heard? Is it administratively burdensome to prescribe it? Are patients having issues getting it? What are these challenges? And I think this is a good opportunity because, I mean, we can go back to Blue Cross Blue Shield and potentially get some of these things improved for, the, for your practices so that it is easier for patients to to get it, or we can work with JMB to try to make it less of a burden, but we need to understand what the challenges are with it so that we know how to address it. So we'll pause there. What have you heard? Okay, so one comment in the chat, Blue Cross Blue Shield provider delivered care manager lists, management lists are not always accurate. They're two months old by the time they come out and not always reflective of who has the PDCM benefit. Okay, thanks so much, Gina. That's good to know. That's definitely something we can take back and something Blue Cross can hopefully have some impact on since it's their lists around uh, who has it. Uh, Dr. Pearson, I know you have your hand raised. Would love oh, for you thanks. to share. Yep. Yeah, pretty similar to what the other groups are, other clinics are mentioning. It's really hard to know what patients have it, and it was very hard to do the facts. Um, I was okay. wondering, can Blue Cross Blue Shield just send a, something like a, a letter to patients who are eligible and say, oh, if you're interested, talk to your doctor at your next appointment, or is that just not possible? I don't know. I, that's absolutely something we can take back to them, though, and talk about like sending a letter um, and as opposed to using like the list and having it be more practice driven. So we can definitely do that. Yes, yeah, so I even tried to join that online, that thing that we're supposed to try to register for so I could just look up patients on the website. And apparently mm -hmm. it's not um, it's not a, like it wasn't allowed for some reason. So I wasn't able to join. So it's just very difficult to know what patients are eligible. Okay. Uh, to trying to join like Blue Cross's Blue Shield, like where they put like the provider delivered care management list. Is that what you're yeah. referring to? Okay. Patients eligibility for that. Okay. Just taking a few notes. So I know what some things to take back. Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for the things put in the chat. So it sounds like um, it's been easier to just send scripts to CGMs for pharmacies uh, for commercial patients versus JMB. So even though it's missing the scale and the blood pressure, it just wasn't worth the time to go through all of it. Challenges with JMB medical and their communication and follow through. I definitely feel like the JMB issues we can take back to, and we do have touch points with Blue Cross Blue Shield and JMB about this, and they've been receptive on these calls to trying to address things so we can bring up some uh, issues with the uh, late phone calls. I know you'd email us about that, Molly, about their general like kind of communication challenges and just the work with it. Um, okay, results. All right. Great. 
This is really helpful. And thank you all so much for sharing all this. This is a great example of a good uh, virtual meeting engagement. I really appreciate all the comments in the chat. I'm going to copy and paste these and save all of them and kind of summarize the issues and bring them back. So the issues with JMB, just so we can get into more detail with them and with Blue Cross when we talk about it, is it just so late phone calls? I know to patients was one specific example. Are they just not reaching not reaching out to patients in a timely manner or uh, is it challenging for the providers to communicate with JMB if they need something so I don't know if anyone has like specific input on that piece of it of exactly where the JMB challenges lie with communication because I think we just want to be a little more specific with them about like these are the challenges I don't know if communication they'll know exactly what uh, we want them to do yeah she this was Molly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hi, Molly. Um, one of the other um, other uh, reported issues with J and B was that they were using snail mail, um, so there's not like a virtual way of mailing the patient. So the patient had to wait for the to receive the paperwork, fill the paperwork out, mail it back, and that mm -hmm. process added time as well. Okay, so if they could do um, mail, do some kind of online or mail virtually, uh, that would be helpful for patients. Uh, not calling late right. hours. I know we have that one. Um, difficult to get a hold of a representative there. Okay, great. This is all incredibly helpful. And I do feel like hopefully we can get these ones that they're in direct uh, kind of control of like representatives calling late mail. Like hopefully we can at least get these addressed. I know that definitely won't fix all of the problems of it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, this is really great. And I know Blue Cross is incredibly invested in this working well. They did a lot on their side to get this benefit like set up and approved and they want it to work too. So all of your input on this is incredibly helpful and we'll take this back. And I think both groups in this, while I know there's been some frustrations around working with JMB and what that's been in the past, I'm really hoping that they will partner on this effort and uh, work to address these and they've been willing to. So, okay. Anything else? And like I said, the comments in the chat are great. I won't read them all aloud, but um, I am going to copy and save all of these and kind of go through and take away some main points. And I really thank you all for sharing them. And please keep adding them if you have not added yours yet. So the next thing I want to talk about, which actually does get to one of the comments in the chat, and I know it won't address it. Uh, across the board, at least at this point. But Miranda, I saw you put you don't like the or the providers don't like that results aren't coming directly to them. We agree that that's a challenge too, and that's something that we want to address. So we've talked with J and B about this a bit, and we at least want to start with Epic EMRs because that's what they've had experience integrating this data to. And like I said, I know that doesn't address this for every MCD 2D practice, but about 50% of our participating practices are on an Epic EMR, so it should at least help with some. We've been working with them and have distributed a survey to um, the practice clinical champions who do use Epic about like the data, where it goes, would it be useful if it, uh, even to the specifics of like, if it goes into the Epic media file, like, is that useful to you? Do you want it to go somewhere else? We also reached out to the POs of Epic to ask about any anticipated barriers of getting this set up from a technical perspective. The technical lift seems like it will be very minor on the, your, on the PO side versus like the JMB side, like it'll be much more on theirs. And I think the costs will be minimal to non-existent on your side as well. And so we're starting with Epic EMRs and hoping to expand to include additional EMRs in the future. And that's kind of what we're getting to with that survey and the questions that we've asked. Yes, we definitely are going to consider integrating into Athena as well. Um, is it all Epic practices? So yes, it would be, they'd be working with the different instances of Epic. I know there'll be like little differences between each ones, but uh we should be able to work amongst them in the differences. In my understanding, as a non-technical person, should be. Yeah. Uh, I know Hurley has kind of a uh, unique situation and they manage their own and have a lot of rules and contracts that have to go in to even get, it's very difficult for us to even get read access for their Epic at appeal level. Okay. Yeah, that's, and that's kind of what we asked a little bit um, about in the survey and the things that we've uh, checked in on. So hopefully, 
Yeah, I don't know. It'll be dependent on each one. I know it's been my limited understanding of it that it is incredibly hard to get just even on the list of priorities for these larger hospital systems for the work that they're doing with Epic. So, okay. Thank um, you. Yep, no problem. Okay, yeah, thank you all. This is really helpful. More to come on this. We'll definitely share this feedback um, regarding that. And then as far as the eligibility list, it sounds like most people are getting it or know where to get it, but that it's assuming for those who have access, Dr. Pierce, I know that you said you didn't, but it just seems like it maybe is outdated or not as helpful as uh, we would want the PDCM list to be since it's two months late. Let me know if there's any different comments or disagreements on that. Okay. Dr. Pierce, did you have your hand raised again? I didn't know if that was from oh, the last time. yeah, sorry. Okay. I was just, yes, no, from your previous ahead. comment, we, we do mm -hmm. have that PDMC list, mm -hmm. but it's in our email. It's just a lot of barriers, especially for non-clinical like clinical champions to prescribe this because mm -hmm. just our other PCPs in our clinic are not going to look at this list or find this list. We can okay. do like, I think 95% of people with Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO will meet this criteria, but it's hard to say to a patient, oh, you're almost likely going to be eligible for this, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just tough. So yes, we do have the PDCM list. I just, you know, and our clinical champions can use it, but if we want to try to get more patients on these and use the other PCPs in our clinic, at least for our clinics, just people who aren't in like our clinical champion group aren't, it's just hard for them. Another barrier to, you know, find the list, use the list and look, look at it every time they're interested in Got trying it. to prescribe it. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay. This is all incredibly helpful. Good feedback. We will for sure uh, take this back. We're hoping to build in PDCM eligibility into the dashboard by the end of the year as well. So hopefully that will be um, a step forward on that too. But in the meantime, we definitely want to make this easier for you to um, have this under control and know who's uh, eligible and who isn't, especially to your point for the physicians that aren't clinical champions at the sites. Hi, Jackie. This is Erica. Uh, sorry, I couldn't raise my hand, but I just wanted to add um, verbally that I put in the comments is that we found really helpful is the PDCM exclusion list. So the groups, the Blue Cross groups that do not have the PDCM benefit, it's very accurate and we use that instead. So really assume all okay. Blue Cross patients have PDCM unless they have one of those insurance groups that are excluded and then we flag them within our system. So eventually when if you guys integrate that into the dashboard, that would be awesome. But yeah, it, I think for Blue Cross, what we've heard, you know, the, the lag, the two to three month lag, the lists are mm -hmm. always outdated. So really going by that process has worked really well. So I just wanted to share okay. that with groups. Thanks so much, Erica. That is very helpful to know. And uh, hopefully that helps everyone else and gives an idea of a different way to approach this that might uh, be helpful for them too. Any final comments on this? Okay, great. We're going to take this all back and we'll provide an update in the March PO call on how some how Blue Cross Blue Shield and JMB plan to address some of these issues. So thanks again, everyone, for sharing that. We really appreciate it. I'm going to hand this over now to Laria on our team, who's going to talk with you a bit about some of the improvements that we're working to make on our patient, patient data dashboards. Laria's been working really hard with the MDC team on coming up with some Really, really great design works based on the feedback that uh, we received from you all and the practice clinical champions on uh, the focus groups around, or the user experience calls around the dashboard. Mara, I'll hand it over to you. Great. And Jackie, do you want me to just say next to move on to the next slide? Are you, are you okay with me screen sharing? Go for it. <laughs> all right. Let me go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that all right? Okay, so I'm just going to talk really fast about um, the process for designing Dashboard 2.0. We're really excited about this because um, we have these patient data dashboards. We've done a lot of really hard work to build them out, to add different features and functionality. And now we're in the process of creating this 2.0 version, which we hope will make them even more uh, usable and useful to our participants. 
Um, so this process of designing has um, started with doing user feedback sessions. So you may remember this from our engagement VBR. Uh, we started originally and did six of these sessions with people and collected some initial data. And then over the last year in 2023, we did 36 total of these 30 minute sessions with different participants. During these conver conversations, we opened up the dashboard and went through some of the different features and functionality. We asked participants how they either were currently using the dashboard in their work or how they would like to be using that, asked them about what they liked and things that they wanted to add. And then we were able to take all this data, pull interview transcripts, and distill it down into a set of updates that we're now currently making to the dashboard in uh, partnership with the Michigan Data Collaborative. So we decided to start with a summary measures page as our starting place for this 2.0 work. And one of the reasons we chose this is because we know that this page is potentially the most relevant to our PO representatives. We can see in our analytics and in our usage that it's PO representatives who are primarily using this page. Um, it was also one of our newer pages and we wanted to make sure that we really put in some, some due diligence and careful thought into what data was presented here and how to make it as usable to the collaborative as a whole. So as part of this process, along with feedback from users, we also reviewed other existing dashboards that are out there for looking for gold standards. This included meeting with multiple of the other CQIs to see how they display summary measures to their participants and also groups like Kaiser Permanente and how this work is being done by other organizations. We also reviewed accessibility guidelines and checklists to make sure this new iteration of the dashboard will be as accessible as possible and follow any ADA requirements. So I just wanted to show here really quickly what some of these new mockups for the dashboard look like. Please know that right now these are these are in progress, these are drafts, so you may see many changes going forward. But this is our new design for what we're calling our dashboard landing page. So as of now, when you log into the dashboard, you go through an attestation process and then are immediately taken to our patient list page. We found that when we did user feedback sessions that this was confusing to people and also sometimes took a long time to load. And so we wanted to create this landing page that would help direct users to where they actually needed to go in the dashboard. So um, we wanted to update our heading here to include really clear, crisp information about when the data was last updated and where it was coming from as well as highlight the different pages. So instead of just having these tabs at the top, like you really see in Tableau, having an easier, more visual way to navigate people to where they needed to go. And then also provide sort of FAQs or any key pieces of information right here on the landing page that people might need. Um, we also wanted to redesign, like I said, we started with the summary measures page, sort of this landing page as a whole. And um, so this is our proposed version of what this looks like. We are working on what these visualizations will actually be. These are just placeholder right now. So um, similar to the dashboard landing page, when you went to summary measures, you would come here and see an overview of important data. Again, here we have different views. So an overview showing some of those key visualizations, pre-populated reports that we'll talk about, and then um, the ability to build and customize your own reports as well, sort of like we currently have now. Again, using this space to really, instead of um, having you have to create your own comparisons and things like that when you come into the dashboard, really leveraging this as a space where you can come in um, and see any critical data and also download and share reports from here. And then having um, pre-populated reports like you can see here. So these might be things um, going into detail on different specific measures um, or also providing comparison reports, looking at how practices, providers uh, compare against each other on different metrics. So again, just a highlight of what some of these might look like. We're also working on things like a health equity dashboard report as well. Um, and we heard from participants that having those comparison reports was really helpful and really desired by the collaborative. So we wanna make sure we have a space um, where people can come to easily find these pre-built out for them. So I'll stop there. Are there any questions that anyone has about this or this process or any recommendations that people want to see included in this? Let me go ahead and stop my share as well. All right, feel free to put any questions for me in the chat or if you wanna follow up at all afterwards. Like I said, we'd love to, to gather feedback from our POs as we work through this process to make sure you guys are, are having access to the um, data and reports that you uh, find the most useful. So Jackie, I'll turn it back to you.
Thanks so much, Laria. And thank you so much for the work on the design redesign. I think it looks fantastic. And I'm really, really excited uh, to see it when it's finalized. So I just wanted to share that with you all. And I'm going to really quickly go through our remaining slides that we have left because I know we're taking a little bit of inhales time. Thank you, April and Sean, for letting us have a few more minutes. Like I said, I'll go through these quickly and you have these slides in your inbox as well. So if you have questions on them, just let me know. So I wanted to talk about PCP recruitment. We're gonna be opening it this week on Wednesday the 14th. We have space to bring on additional 75 practices like we've discussed in the past. You'll note the practices that you'd like to have joined in your administrative portal. You'll be able to see these beginning on Wednesday by clicking on PCP practice recruitment in the left-hand sidebar, it'll show you all of your eligible practices. And I'll remind you on the next slide what practice eligibility entails. You'll have until April 19th to nominate your practices to join. And then following that, we'll report out to you on the total number of applicants and begin just evaluating who will join the collaborative based on the criteria that we previously shared around location, uh, being a safety net practice, et cetera. And you can see those in the January PO call slides. For eligibility, we ask that they have an EMR and then Blue Cross Blue Shield to set the eligibility criteria of being a PDCM practice, so 25 or more type 2 diabetes Blue Cross patients, or a PGIP practice with 75 or more Blue Cross patients. Also, for your physicians in it to earn VBR, they need to be a PCMH practice, so I would strongly recommend only enrolling PCMH practices within the program. Uh, our PO recruitment is currently open right now. Uh, in the March PO calls, we'll report any additional POs that are joining the program too. Similar to practices, we limited it, and so we'll have spots for up to four to join, so we'll report back on that. We have a couple things that we're doing in order to support uh, you recruiting your sites. We're hosting a recruitment webinar on March 11th, and I'll send an email following this meeting with these as well. Uh, that's gonna be a introduction to MCTTD for practices. Our program directors are gonna lead that. It's gonna walk through the QI, the requirements, et cetera. Our team has also created an intro to MCTTD recruitment packet as well. That's fantastic. I'll include that as an attachment in the email following this meeting too. That has things like benefits to clinicians for joining, clinical champion responsibilities, et cetera. We're gonna be posting this on our website too under the join page with the links to both of these. That's not up yet, but I'll distribute them via email in the meantime. Specialist VBR, one of the requests we had from the PO calls was an exportable final VBR. So we've implemented that for this session with specialists and we'll do that with PCP practices going forward as well. So if you have specialist sites that are participating on the homepage of the portal, you'll see a button that says downloads final specialist VBR report and it's gonna generate a PDF. Like it says on this slide and on the report, unless you have specifically heard from us that a physician isn't gonna be receiving VBR for the next cycle. Even if they have a requirement marked as unmet on your final report, they're going to continue receiving VBR for the next year. We evaluate it based on the practice, performance and engagement and everything else. So unless you have heard from us, everyone that was previously earning it continues to earn it going forward. Another piece, one of the requirements for continuing specialists, so cohorts one and two, is to identify a primary care practice to partner with. This is due on April 1st, and you can now do this in the portal as well. There's a SCP PCP partnership button on the left hand sidebar. It'll show your specialist practice and all of your participating PCP practices. Um, this is also listed under the current specialist VBR requirements for more details. Like I said, I'm not going to go over it here just because we're already close on time, but that's available in the portal as well. Uh, the year three VBR will be available in the portal too for what that all entails for both new and continuing sites. Uh, that VBR year, like for all specialists, the VBR year officially starts on March 1st. Some have it, uh, some due dates prior to the start date for those newly joining sites, like identifying a clinical champion, et cetera. Reminder briefly about learning community events. We have one right after this at noon about referral to specialists where we'll have a nephrologist and endocrinologist speaking about some uh, considerations regarding referral and supporting sites in that. And then in March, we'll be touching on what's new in the ADA 2024 guidelines as well. We'll make sure to communicate these to your practices via email and via the learning community newsletter. And then as a last, just really quick reminder, statin use is a HEDIS measure. You can use your dashboards to identify this. 
The directions are on this next step uh, as well around how to find this on the dashboard. So hopefully this is helpful to you. If this is a measure that you're tracking and wanting to improve on, you should be able to see any patients who aren't on a stat and who would benefit from being on one. And then finally, our future administrative or PO reports are going to be in the admin portal and not be distributed via email any longer. Beginning with the 2024 reports, we'll just let you know when they're available. And we're going to be putting the historical reports there as well. And we're also going to be building out a PO resources section on the admin portal too. All of this is an effort to make the admin portal more of an easy one-stop shop for you for everything that you might need related to the collaborative so that you don't have to search through emails. I don't know about you, but Outlook search function is terrible for me. So hopefully if we can make things easier to find and access on the admin portal, we'll save you searching through some emails. So we'll try to be hosting more things there. And so these are both an effort towards that. And then finally, if you haven't completed the Blue Cross Blue Shield Coordinating Center survey, we'd really appreciate you doing so. This was distributed to you via email and the survey closes tomorrow. Sorry for the rapid fire covering of those last slides. Just wanted to give Inhale back their time. Thank you all for sharing so much about the Patient Empowerment Toolkit. We sincerely appreciate your feedback on that. And like I said, we'll let you know more in March uh, based on our conversations with Blue Cross Blue Shield and JMB based on that feedback. And with that, I will hand it over to Sean. Thank you, Jackie. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, so just give everyone a couple minutes to transition off prior to getting started. All right, and just to confirm, can everyone see my screen okay? Perfect, thank you, Gina. All right, um, so thank you very much for um, joining us today for our February uh, Inhale Monthly PO Call. We'll go ahead and get started for our agenda today. Um, and just as a, a uh, reminder as well, if you do have any questions, you can uh, feel free to enter them in the chat. You can also obviously come um, off speaker and uh, ask them as well. And obviously we'll have some Q&A at the end just for um, for questions. So for our, our agenda today, we're gonna go over some announcements and updates. Uh, we're gonna go over some medication updates uh, regarding the flow vent discontinuation. Um, we're gonna review the clinical newsletter launching. Uh, excited about that. Um, spring regional meetings, as Jackie uh, went through in great detail, we're gonna touch on that as well. Uh, we're gonna review some PCP recruitment updates. We're gonna go through the executive committee uh, recruitment, uh, our, our lung learning labs registration, and then questions and discussion. So um, announcements and updates. So um, awesome news. So MTI is that everyone is aware we've been working to uh, do a spirometry pilot with them. Uh, we've actually onboarded two pilot sites uh, with a potential third in the wings. Uh, they were actually went out to do uh, really successful trainings last week. Uh, so we'll be able to provide additional um, information as we have it from um, the progress of those and how those are doing. Um, again, if you are, if you do have uh, practices that could be interested in that, um, we're just gonna do a, a quick plug. Um, again, uh, reach out to inhale-support um, at med.umich.edu and uh, let us know if you know of anyone that's interested and we will we'll get the ball rolling. Um, next, um, sorry, in April, we're gonna be kicking off our MOC um, for, uh, that's gonna be focused on our inhaler education measure. Um, so well, what we'd like to do for this is to obtain um, the level of interest. We'd like each of our um, POs to email us um, by March 1st. So you've got about two, two and a half weeks. Uh, so at the inhale support at med.umisha.edu. Um, essentially what, what we'd like to have is no, the number of physicians that um, are potentially interested in this, um, number of uh, PAs interested. And again, uh, we'd like to have that feedback by March 1st. So please keep that on your radar uh, so we can get that up and moving for you. 
The biennial B, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan survey, as Jackie just pointed out, uh, just as a reminder, that is due tomorrow, February 13th. So please make sure that you have that completed and we, we thank you in advance for that. All right, medication updates. So uh, we wanted to, uh, to provide you again um, some updates uh, from the on the following medications at least. So as of February 2nd, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is now gonna be covering uh, the 44 microgram dose of fluticasone ABA for children less than five years of age. Um, so for that, no, no QBAR trial is required and no prior authorization is required. So there's one quick update on that. Again, we've been having a lot of um, a lot of conversations around this lately, um, and also um, the for Delera, the commercial insurance plans Aetna and CVS Caremark um, are now um, covering Delera, so that's been added to their formulary. So again, we've been making a lot of um, a lot, a lot of progress on this, and obviously we are you know um, working with uh, Blue Cross and all of you to make sure that we are um, we're doing. Um, what we can. So um, let us know if you have, have any other additional questions on that, and we will keep you updated. Uh, clinical newsletter. So awesome uh, piece of news here. So we took feedback from all of you, um, specifically stating that you wanted a clinically fo focused newsletter. So that's actually what we're going to be doing. Um, so we're going to be, this is going to be coming out soon, uh, but the bi-monthly um, it's going to be a bi-monthly bi letter that's going to be um, content's going to be geared specifically for frontline providers. So updates on smart therapy, biologic, uh, biologics, new guidance information, uh, formulary updates, and then providing resources as well. So um, what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to disseminate that down to the practice and provider level uh, just so we can give them um, as many resources and updates as possible. All right, spring regional meetings for 2024. So Jackie hit on this quite a bit, but I just want to re, uh, reiterate. So we're working um, collaboratively with Blue Cross um, Blue Shield and obviously MCT2D. Uh, but for this, um, we, we are going to work to do our um, spring regional meeting. So May 24 uh, for the dates of May 7th, 8th, 14th and 15th, we're gonna have those um, virtually. So again, a key component of this is to make sure that we have a very high level of engagement. Um, you know, obviously, what, one of the things that we're trying to make sure that we have happen is to ensure that everyone is, you know, fu fully engaged in these meetings. So your camera being on, uh, we want to make sure that you're participating in breakouts, uh, the Q&A sessions, um, acknowledgement of uh, participation expectations, obviously. Um, and then you may be requested to download an app like a hoot or a poll everywhere prior to this, just to make sure that everyone can access all of those, um, all of those um, appropriately. So the region, uh, regional meeting dates and registration will be opening March 1st. So please be um, looking out for those. And again, this is going to be on a trial basis for 2024 um, so far. And it's not guaranteed for 25. So again, they want to see uh, the level of engagement and see how everything goes for the session. So again, just going to kind of go off and piggyback what Jackie said. So really looking uh, to make sure that everyone is, um, again, uh, participating um, on the calls, on camera, so we can hopefully continue to do these moving forward. So we can uh, be a little bit um, better as far as um, working with all of you and knowing um, your commitments and uh, and schedules. So if you have any questions, please let us know and uh, we will provide some more information in the near future. Uh, PCP recruitment. So it's actually opening uh, February 15th. So just a, a few days away. Um, so um, we, we're going to add additional practices and PCPs, um, or you can add them until April 29th. Um, so they must be uh, PGIP eligible and PCMH designated. So just wanted to give you a quick note about that. Um, as a reminder, you need to add them to the inhales um, admin portal. And then to quickly cover, they can earn VBR beginning 9-1 of 24. Uh, so the measurement period beginning 9-1-24 for the 2025 VBR. So these are obviously on our website. We've sent them out a few times, but um, some of the specific requirements for this are going to be 
the attendance of the fall 2024 regional meeting by the practice clinical champion, also the attendance of the uh, spring 25 regional meeting for the practice clinical champion. Um, again, they're, they're going to have to do a um, completion of the inhaled medication, excuse me, inhaled me me a medication training module. Um, so keep an eye on that. And then other participation requirements are going to be as outlined again on our, um, our card as well. And then again, to meet the PO performance VBR measure. So um, again, we, we have those all um, specifically noted out in the inhale adult and pediatric primary care physician um, VBR measure. But if you have any other questions on that, please let us know. Another really exciting thing that Megan and her team has been working on um, quite, quite, um, quite hardly, but um, we're uh, working on an executive committee uh, a recruitment board. So basically, sorry, executive committee board. Um, but what we're looking to do is we're looking to have a lot of engagement from, um, from all of you. So the vision for this board is gonna be a committee made up of collaborative participants and key stakeholders to offer guidance on some of the following. Uh, so VBR measures, uh, future measure development and target setting, ongoing analysts of data and trends, and then pertinent information from the frontline provider perspective. So for these meeting cadence um, and time requirements, uh, we're looking at quarterly meetings that will be about an hour and a half, um, and then we're going to have ad hoc meetings as needed. So the review of the data items and proposals um, meetings will probably be about a hour long. Um, those would be a little bit um, shorter meetings. And then we're going to have one in-person meeting um, a year that's going to be to be determined at this point. So our goal is to have this uh, launch um, in the summer of uh, this year. So we'll have some additional information on that coming up. And then just to kind of go through what we're looking for from a, a membership perspective. So the goal of the 13 members, uh, we'd like to have one to two PO administrators uh, we'd like to have a PharmD, seven clinical champions, uh, four practicing providers from specialties, and then um, we ob obviously would love to have nurses and or asthma educators. Um, so represent uh, representative of our PO providers and specialists. Um, we again, we would like to have a um, you know a broad based uh, group here. So allergists, pediatricians, pediatric pulmonologists, PharmDs, PCPs, pulmonologists. And then our goal is to have a good geographic representation of the entire collaborative. Um, so we can obviously bring in um, views from um, multiple, multiple areas in, uh, of, the, of the state. So more to come again on this, um, but from a recruitment timeline and questions perspective, uh, we're gonna have a call for nominations that's gonna open up um, now and then it's gonna close on March 31st. So the review of the nominees, as we get them, we're going to do that in April, uh, and that's going to be conducted by the coordinating center. So um, when we go through that process, we will let you know um, or let them know um, who um, has been nominated, and that notification of membership is going to be in April as well. And we're looking to ho um, house our initial meeting in June of this year. And then a few other comments about this. So from a nomination perspective, um, we'd like the, um, just to let everyone know that um, to complete the nomination form, it's gonna be um, housed in the admin portal. So there's two ways of doing that, either a self-nomination or you can nominate a colleague. Um, so a couple notes on that. And then again, the coordinating center will be following up with the nominees individually. And another bonus um, it, of this is going to be there's going to be a bonus VBR point awarded for the nomination. So again, thank you very much for your help with that. Um, moving on to our lung learning labs, uh, we had a really, really um, great um, um, seminar um, you know last month uh, uh, regarding COPD, um, COPD updates. So. Um, you know, thank you for for uh, joining that. And just to kind of go over a few um, notes about that. So again, it's going to be a live Zoom event uh, registration. So again, pre-registration is required to attend these uh, this event. 
So this is so we can better track attendance and CME. Um, registration can be done through our admin portal. The link is below here. But if you have any questions about that, please let us know. Um, and as a reminder, you do not need an account to register. Um, after you have registered, you will receive a confirmation email with all the relevant details uh, for each event that you registered for. As a reminder, please keep that email. It will include the Zoom link for the live event. And then from a CME standpoint through Beaumont, um, CME will be offered for each event that is attended. So that's four hours total and is available for AMA, PRA, Category 1, ANCC, ACPE, and Interprofessional Continuing Education. Uh, to claim your credit, a survey will be provided to you post-event, and you'll be asked to create an account in the Beaumont portal, um, unless you already have one. Uh, from there, you'll be able to instruct it to attest that you attended the event, and the CME credit will then be automatically applied to your credentials. So uh, live versus recording viewing, uh, just as a quick reminder, attendance um, to at least one session of the um, lung learning uh, series is a VBR requirement for all practice clinical champions and all PCPs and SCPs currently participating in inhale. So just as a, a reminder for that. If you are unable to attend one of the four live sessions, um, they will be recorded and available on the inhale learning education platform in early spring. Um, as a reminder, activities must be met by August 31st of 24 to receive your VBR payment. And then a post-session survey will be distributed or available in the learning platform. Um, completion of the survey will automatically mark this requirement as met in the admin portal. And then just as a quick highlight, Dr. Lugogo, um, our program director is actually going to be doing her um, upcoming um, a talk on biologics and severe asthma on the on February 22nd. So if you haven't already registered for that, please do. And we look forward to seeing you. Um, some upcoming events, just to kind of recap uh, what we currently have coming up down uh, down the line. Uh, next month call, uh, call dates for the PO calls are going to be on March 11th at 11 or March 13th at 2 p.m. Uh, again, the lung, lung Learning Lab series is going to run from February through April. Um, our 2024 uh, Summer Collaborative Wide is going to be June 7th in Lansing. And then, as we talked about quite a bit earlier, our spring regional meetings for this year, um, they're going to be May 7th, 8th, 14th, and 15th, and those will all be virtually. So, again, that is a reminder for those. Um, our MOC project on in, uh, inhaler education, we're, we're going to have more information um, coming out, but that's targeted for April of 24. So please keep keep that in mind. And then I know we do have some questions in the chat, so I'm just flipping over real quick, but we can kind of go through those if they already haven't been addressed by our team. It looks like the majority of them have been. Um, but does anyone else have any questions that they currently have that they haven't already asked? Well, let me go ahead and share. I didn't see anything else new in here. Uh, but again, we have um, several ways you can contact us. Um, obviously, our inhales um, at support. Um, you can always reach us there. Uh, you can go to our website, inhalecqi.org. CQ, um, um, we obviously have an Instagram, Instagram and Twitter, also known as X. Um, and then for the Michigan um, Data Collaborative, um, if you have any technical support issues, then they can help you out at Michigan Data Collaborative at med.umich.edu. So I will just give a couple more moments, but um, again, if anyone else has any questions, thoughts, ideas, happy to hear them. And if not, we will um, speak with you next month and or if you're joining our call on Wednesday, we'll be reconvening at that time. Okay, 
Well, thank you very much for your time today and joining. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out and I uh, hope you have a lovely day. Bye everyone.